Hey, what up? It's G and Chip. I mean, who else? I mean, look at us. Who else are we, right? Um, <laughs> welcome to Small Camera <laughs> Big Picture Podcast. We're going to be talking about some fun and maybe inflammatory, maybe skeezy, skeezy, down in the wheezy kind of topics. I don't know. I'm just making it up as we go. But we're talking about full frame for the sake of full frame, basically the full frame game and what you need to know. So we're going to be covering, you know, you do you need, do you really, really need full frame and what is it going to be doing for you? And is this more of a marketing ploy? Um, and then we're going to show, we're going to talk about a project that was done with a very small sensor and it's a pretty rad project. Um, do you really need to go mirrorless full frame when you have a full frame DSLR is a really and really spending your money in the right way. And then, of course, what about Micro Four Thirds? Um, we got a lot to say. I'm going to throw it over to Chip. Did you like that? <laughs> What's up? Yeah, nice. Uh, 3D. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Julio? Hey, man. Hey, man. Uh, glad, to, glad to be here. So... What should we, let's let's kind of dive in. Let's just dive right in. So, you know, it's like there's how many systems are there now in the market? There's almost like 13 or 14 systems now, like like modern systems, right? Yeah, I mean, it, well, I, I think there's probably like five or six that are really kind of on it. But you know, I guess if you kind of break it out to the crop sensor and the full frame sensors into their own different systems then yeah you're up in that number yeah and i mean it is you know i, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is there any of these cameras that are not good i don't think there's a single camera in a market that, that you, you could point at and you're like that's just not a good camera no everything is fantastic i mean all the way from you know Micro Four Thirds to crop sensor, you know, APS-C up to full frame, up to medium format. I don't think you can buy really a bad camera at this point in time, um, you know, and the lenses are all kind of walking in lockstep with the bodies at this point. So mm -hmm. everything is, you know, I mean, you can go in, into pretty much any store or go on any, you know, website and I don't think you're going to go wrong with whatever you pick. Even that Pentax, what was it called? The Q? Was that it? The tiny, tiny little interchangeable lens camera. Remember that thing? Oh, yeah. Was it Was it the Q? That thing also had a pretty rad little sensor in it, and it took cool photos. It was like a tiny little interchangeable lens camera. I'm, I'm going to try to pick up one of those on the used market for Roman because um, I don't want him using my GM1 anymore. But, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, he's not even three years old. And he's like rocking my GM1. I'm like, dude, don't drop it, please. Um not that I would want to drop a Pentax, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, even that thing is good. And I, I know people that shot with it um, seriously. And that, I forgot I the size of that sensor, but I think it was like maybe iPhone sensor. Uh, it was, I think it was a little bigger. Maybe. I think it was okay. just, I think it was uh, like a one inch. It was like around a one inch sensor in that. But I mean, you know, you can shoot great work with that stuff. So let's talk about like the needs of, of this stuff. Cause you know, you go on YouTube and everyone's geeking out about full frame because it does this and does that. I don't think they really understand what's going on. Um, not trying to diss on people, but you see it all over Instagram. Um, but, you know, speaking of Instagram, so really that's that's where people are sharing our, our, fo our photos. Now, if you are sharing, if you're shooting for a print publication, your normal magazine cover I don't know, eight and a half by 11 or whatever they're, they're running. That's a roughly an eight megapixel image, right? That is it. And when I started shooting um, micro four thirds in 2011, I was shooting um, magazine covers with the pen mini that I won from Olympus. I had a DSLR, I had a 5D Mark II, but I was like, dude, this pen mini is great. And everyone loved it. And eight megapixel, it was actually, no, what was it, 12th? I think it was 12. I think it was 12. So we had room to crop, you know, and it's just like I did low light shoots for covers. Um, you know, I did a lot of daylight stuff. Daylight was preferred because low light, it does increase the, the sensor noise, but it wasn't unusable. And here we are some years later. 
especially for the stuff that you were shooting, which was newsprint, right? Yes, yeah, some, media. yeah. Some of it were glossy covers, um, but but mostly mostly newsprint covers. I mean, it was just fine. I never got any pushback, you know. And for me, like that was like the point where it was good enough. I'm like, I had a 5D Mark II, which is more resolution than the Mark One, which is what. I had prior to that, and that was a 12 megapixel camera, and I had images from that by clients blown up to cover the sides of buildings for these giant um, parties. They were doing premiere parties and stuff. No one ever had any issue with it, and prior to that, I had a 5 megapixel Olympus E1 that I shot covers with, and I, you know. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is, you know, what's, how, where, where do we draw the line and say, okay, enough is enough? I spent Five thousand dollars on my camera system. Yeah, it's a older Micro Four Thirds camera, but it's still good today. I'm still able to do what I need to do. Why do I need to even look at a 65 megapixel full frame or 100 megapixel uh, medium format? I mean, you know, it's like where do where do people say, okay, enough's enough? I mean, save my money and go do something else. <laughs> Well, I think if you're approaching it from a professional point of view, then, you know, and you're doing a lot of heavy retouching on an image or, um, you know, things of that nature, that's where you want to get into the higher megapixel cameras. Uh, I know Dave Weigold, um, you know, who we, we had on previously, he had talked about wanting to get into like the the newer, the, can, the Canon that had a, you know, higher megapixel um, just for that reason, for retouching and whatnot. But um, I think for the average shooter, it's, it's it's totally overkill. I mean, and and also you kind of got to think that along with these bodies, you're having to upgrade your lenses along the way too, um, you know, so and your computers and everything else because, you know, working with a uh, file size that is like 60 megapixels is just got to be insane. Um, I know even with myself, I'm, I'm shooting, uh, I have the 36 megapixel D810 Nikon and it's honestly way more than what I need. So I've been kind of reviewing some other options, um, because I, I just don't need that kind of resolution. And for me with what I shoot and the kind of shooting that I do, it just doesn't make sense to kind of have that overhead as far as the, the file size is concerned. Yeah, it adds up. I mean, I had... Last year, at some point, I had the Sony A7R3, and I forget what that was, like 45 megapixels, and it was just like too much. Now, now keep in mind, my iPad Pro, when I would ingest into Lightroom CC on there, it handled it fine, but you got to think about when, if you bring in a Photoshop, you start adding layers and whatever, and then it's like these files become huge, and how many of those files before your storage gets full, and like you said, it just becomes this huge thing. So it's like I had to get good lenses. The lenses were big. Memory cards. Memory cards were expensive for, I forgot the, the it was, I think it was UHS-2. It was just like, I was like, dude, this is ridiculous. When I got clients that their budgets are shrinking and for them, a lot of times, I mean, I'm a full-time dad, you know? I mean, I, I mean, I think anyone who's a dad's a full-time dad, I would think, but I just say it, I'm a full-time dad. Because I'm, I love being a dad, but it's, so it's like everywhere I go, like I'm like, can I bring this camera and put it in my in the diaper bag, you know? And and I'm like, why would I do that? It's like eight thousand dollar camera and put it in a freaking diaper bag. It's not that I don't value taking pictures of my son, I do, but it's like at what point, you know? Not I mean, and believe me, for me guys, personal photos is far more valuable than client work. Do you do the client work for for, for the Skrilla, and I do you know, photograph my friends and family because I, that, that's the love. So those are more valuable to me. And even then it's like, I'm just like, do you, I don't need this kind of resolution. I mean, do I need to see every little hair on my son's eye when I'm doing a full body image? And it's like, I don't. What I need to do is capture the emotions. Um, have a, And to do that, I need to carry a camera with me everywhere. And it just didn't make sense. I was just like, Out. Now, I, I will say, I, I will say that um, I, I do when I do some assignments where I'm either like a second shooter on a commercial shoot or something, or it's or I just hire a tech, 
and the tech happens to have a Canon system, which is usually the standard kit. You have your MacBook Pro, you got your external monitor, your drives, and your Canon 2 5D4 kits. I am not so dedicated to any one system where I'm like, tell, where I'm going to tell the tech, you got to learn this Lumix, or you got to learn this Olympus, or Sony, or whatever, so that we could do the shoot. I'm just like, you know, cool. We'll rent your Canons. We'll pass the call, the the pass it off to the client because there's a budget for that, and I'm going to shoot it, and they're going to set up the exposure. And what do I care at that point? What I hold. Because I'm just there and I'm gone. I don't have to lug that around all the time. And then, you know, it's it's just a job. It's just a trans uh, a transaction. Beyond that, though, I'm just like, what do I need it for? You know? I don't think most of us do. No, I mean, for me, the sweet spot is somewhere between 16 and 24 megapixels. Uh, that's kind of what I've determined. Um, you know, it's it, and and honestly, even with a 12 megapixel body, I I still have a D700 that I use. You can do a double truck, double page spread in a magazine with that without any problems. Yeah, and it looks damn good too. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I was doing it with a D200, which was a 10 megapixel and a crop sensor. So, I mean, it's. It's easy, easy enough to do it with that. Yeah, and who's doing that anymore, anyways? I mean, I think the double truck now is where people are dicing up their photos for the uh, the Instagram slideshow. You know, yeah. where they zoom yeah, in. I mean, and that's a good point. I mean, the the majority of the content that's being created is going online, and so you know, uh, to to kind of keep. Everything small for mobile, and to which is kind of the primary viewing device that's out now. And um, you know, they're you're cropping stuff down to maybe what 1920, 1080. That's going to be probably the biggest file size that you're going to be dealing with. So <laughs> you're taking a 60 megapixel image and cropping it down to uh, to that big. I mean, you know, if you talk about landscape shooters, they're going out, they're making prints then, you know, maybe there is the potential for that. But honestly, I don't know. I mean, it just really comes down to what is your purpose for taking a photograph? And are you going to, um, what are you going to, what's the end result for that? And that should be determining the gear that you're picking, not, you know, the latest and greatest 60 megapixel sensor. 100%. I mean, you always start with the end in mind now. I, I will say that I think all the new camera tech coming out is really cool. Uh, that full frame uh, or the, um, what is it? This, the Fuji 100 megapixel camera I think is really neat. I think the Sonys are really cool. I think it's all good. It's all cool stuff. But at some point I'm like, buy it for what purpose other than spending my money when quite frankly I can get something else that I'm really happy with, save a lot of money, and I don't know if I want, if I have cheese to spend and I want to go do some sort of photo stuff, take a trip, take, totally. do, a, do a photo tour if you want to be one of the photographers or go on vacation. I mean, there's so many Go to ways. Iceland with all the other photographers. <laughs> For real. I mean, there's so many other ways to do it. Um, you know, the used market is really good because I think a lot of people are kind of realizing that they don't need all that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're seeing brand, I'm seeing like gently used Nikon Z's, the Panasonic's, the Sony's, the Canon's, everything used, and the prices are really good. But even then, even then, there are other things that make you kind of question full frame, and we're starting to, to see that here in the market. But before we continue, why don't we um, chat about the uh, catcalling series? You want to kind of intro yeah. us into that? Uh, well, I mean, it's it's being put together by uh, Sherry Niaz Littlefield, which I'll probably I probably butchered her middle name as far as uh, the pronunciation of it. But so she lives in New York, and uh, I guess she's been dealing with catcalling all the time uh, for many many years, and so she decided to start to document that. Um, with these Snapchat glasses, which have a little tiny camera in them, and you can kind of discreetly take photos. And um, I guess they they show a little light up on the the glass itself, and then it shuts off. So 
Um, she's been able to kind of put together um, a body of work so far. She's been doing this since April. And, um, you know, it's just really uh, powerful work, in my opinion. Just, you know, <laughs> it kind of makes me embarrassed for my gender, honestly. But, um, you know, uh, you can look at it on our website. I know the photographer did a, a piece on it, but, um, you know, I think the best place to, to view it is, is on Instagram because she is putting in kind of some of the banter back and forth between the, uh, assailant, which I would totally call them assailants at this point, uh, and, and her, you know, and so it's, it's super powerful. I know what, what did you think about it? Yeah. I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, this is, where the power of photography really comes into play. This is not about just making pretty pictures, but this is about a photo that says something. And um, man, it, it's really, it's it makes you question a lot of things as a straight white man of privilege. It makes me really think, and I kind of get a little grossed out when I read some of the comments that these people, these men are saying, and you know what? God, I don't even want to use the word men. They're like men babies, but they're saying it to, to her. And it's not just to her. I mean, it happens to a lot of people, even back like when I was a kid listening to Queen Latifah, she had a whole, a whole track about this. You know, this is something that's ongoing. Um, it just brings up a lot of, it brings up a good conversation that I think we need to have in society. And, and that's what makes the photography good. You know, I think some people will look at it and be like, oh, it's pixelated. But that's, then that, that's the case. They're missing a point. But Beyond the point, honestly. Yeah, it really, it so is. Um, yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's, it's fantastic and, stuff. And by using this, you know, I don't think she could have pulled this off any other way. Because, you know, if she was to take a camera and put it to her eye, you know, that's going to completely change the dynamic of the interaction between her and this person. So and I and I know they cover that in the photographer article, so I don't really want to kind of you know just crib on that, but it definitely changes it. But for me, it's like I look at this and say, okay, here is technology that really wasn't available up until a couple of years ago, with Google Glass being the first thing that that had this, and um, you know she's using it in a way that is beyond the original intent for for the technology. But it's also taking something that is extremely low resolution that you wouldn't think that could pull off a project like this and pushing it. So I find that, you know, super exciting. Yeah, I mean, she's using the camera as a creative tool, which is really what it, what it should be. Uh, especially, I mean, we're really at this point now where, and, and I, I preached about this years ago when I was like, hey, we're going into the world of, you know, an age of screens. And I got a lot of pushback. And I'm like, you know, you just need, you only need a small camera, just get a small camera because you're going to be shooting for screens. It doesn't have to be anything insane. And now we have really awesome, small micro four thirds cameras. But, you know, where we are now is we're really starting to see the shift. And this has been going on for years, but it's really becoming more mainstream where it's all about what the photo is saying and, and the creativity put into that versus, oh, it's sharp corner to corner or you could see the pupils, or none of that matters, especially when at the end of the day, you're sharing it to Instagram. You know, I mean, you could have Instagram as, you could really consider that as your own website if, if you want, um, but that's that's the reality of it, is we're sharing it to Instagram. So, you know, would she, she wouldn't have benefited at all she wouldn't, with, with a, a larger camera, with a dedicated camera, and you wouldn't really be able to tell too much. It wouldn't, it's not going to, uh, impact the image, even if she could get them with a dedicated camera, because it's like, where is the, where are you getting the, the news out? And that's on, that's on Instagram. Totally. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that kind of dovetails nicely into kind of what we were talking about before. And it's just, you know, here is somebody that is making really powerful work with something that is, you know, I, I would say it's sub cell phone uh, as far as like the image quality. And so just very, very cool. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're being, if you are applying your creativity, now this is something that a lot of um, a big portion of the photography population are not really into. They say they're into, but they're not. 
they just kind of want to have a little, hey, this is how I do this little trick, and then have this thing that someone else has made. But it really, your creativity takes effort, and so that's what she's putting into this is effort. Like, it's not an easy thing if somebody is saying some crappy stuff to you. You want to get out of that situation as quickly as possible, but here she is. She's taking a photograph of it, documenting it, and then leaving the situation, um, which is, you know, for her best interest. So it's very brave of her to do that, and it's because she's putting in the effort, which is often we we don't think about too often, is, is, is the, the effort that we have to put in. If you're putting an effort into your creativity, you can get a Game Boy camera and make something that's interesting to, to look at. Right. It may not be your, I mean, no one's going to, so, you know, she is uh, shooting with uh, Nikon and Leica as well. So she does have her yep. proper cameras. She's also a curator at a museum. So she knows art and she knew going into this that, you know, spectacles are going to be what gets the job done and it has, and it's fantastic. And that is where photography crosses over an art. And that is the, where we're going into now is what are your photos saying? What's the art? Um, you know, it's it's fantastic. You know, I, I think everyone needs to see it. We'll definitely link to it in the show notes. For sure. So, so where do you want to go now? <laughs> so why why do you think why do you think there's all these new f- systems in the market? It's like, here's the funny thing, right? If you read certain websites, they're like, oh, the camera market's shrinking. Every day you hear this, the camera market's shrinking. I'm like, okay, by now. No one should be buying cameras then. Is that if you keep believing all this crap you read, it's shrinking, it's shrinking, it's shrinking. I'm like, cool. Well, every time I go into a camera store, I see people buying cameras. Every time. We got Precision Camera here, and I tell you, they move a lot of product. And if you've ever been in a B&H, those conveyor belts don't stop. People are buying cameras. Crazy. Yep. You know, and you keep reading about the camera market shrinking. Well, if it's shrinking, then why are all these new systems coming out? These are not like. This is these are not fly by night companies that are just kind of like yeah. they're just kind of like hanging out having some beers with the fellows and like hey I got a good idea everybody let's just make a camera system hey that sounds <laughs> great we'll we'll do it tomorrow you know that's just not how it works so if if these companies are putting these camera systems out it's because there's a market for it it may not be exactly what it was it never would be will be and but certainly there's a market for it you know? Yeah, I mean, I think these are um, the larger sensor cameras are what gets people into the door. They are not going to have the cheese to put down on a system like that, but that is what's going to pull them in. And then they're going to end up buying, you know, in, in Sony land, they're going to end up buying the A7. They're not going to buy the A7R4 or whatever it is now. You know, and that's that's and they're going to have the kit lens on it and that is what they're going to use. And that is going to be primarily what people are buying. You know, it's not it's I think that these these systems that we're seeing, these high megapixel systems, the the quantity that is being produced is probably pretty low. And actually what they're selling of them is probably pretty low. You know, you've got all the influencers and you've got all the the pros that are sponsored by these brands shooting this stuff but i think they're most likely selling the lower end stuff and that's kind of what they're they're making most of their money on yeah i mean that's how it was when i was in college and worked at a camera store people would come in all day every day and like i want this canon rebel which was a film camera at the time was pretty hot and Mm -hmm. you know or they would be like i want this bigger nikon or whatever and i'm like well tell me what you need well, tell me the type of photography you do. And then they're like, well, I'm going to go travel to Europe and we're going to da, 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 Okay, well, what you really need then is this lens and this lens. So if you buy these lenses with this camera, is it, you're, is it, you're hitting your budget? I am. Okay, well, then you can get pretty much everything that the bigger camera does for a fraction of the cost. Here you go. It's better for the customer. It's better for me as a salesperson in a camera store because I had to make a little more money. And it was better for everyone all around, you know, and that's, that is kind of like the same thing that's happening today. I mean, if you look at the Olympus em one X, that's a pretty dope camera. Uh, it's a $3,000 camera and, uh, I'm sure a lot of people look at it. I, I did. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. 
but I'm like, what I do I need anything that robust? Um, because it's with that kind of speed for how I shoot, I don't. So I would be like, well, I'm gonna go look at a, a EM1 Mark II that I want to say is like less than half the price. Or how about a used EM5 I Mark used, II? Yeah, a used EM5 Mark II can go for 500 or less. And then you put your money where it really should go, which is into the, the glass. Glass, totally. Because I tell you, man, micro. I, I think of all the systems, Micro Four Thirds has the coolest, coolest glass, hands down. Definitely, yeah. It's got the largest pool that fits that mount for sure. I mean, because you're not restricted by one manufacturer, whereas, like, say, with a Nikon or a Canon or Sony, for that matter, you would be. I mean, I, you could put an adapter on it, but. You know, you're going to really want the autofocus and everything. Yeah, adapters suck, man. That's something that I see all the time. You know, these guys shooting it, I'm just like, you have a camera that can autofocus like a beast and you're putting this adapter on. You're just like, I mean, I guess if, you know, an occasion, <clears throat> excuse me, if you got like the right lenses and you're like, you know, a certain lens, you want that look, totally. But for your main lens, I mean, the lenses that are available, native, I'm, I'm a big native lens dude, Um for my everyday type of shooting. But yeah, I, I think that that's, that's where people should put their money is put it into the glass unless you really need that high end body, you know, try to totally temper, temper your gear lust and put it into the glass. Cause the glass is going to make a better picture on any camera going forward if it's a good lens. But if you have a camera that's like, does shoot at 60 megapixels and you got a crappy lens. I used to see this all the time too. You still do. People have these amazing camera bodies and they have these crummy little plastic lenses. And it's just like, what, what someone, someone did you wrong in, in the sales department, you know? Well, or they just bought the body and they had the glass, you know, and it, it, that's something that you see all the time. I mean, that's something that I think people need to be aware of is, you know, you have this, you have an older body and you have a collection of glass and then you want to upgrade. I mean, that's kind of the situation that I'm in, you know, it's like I have older Nikon glass cause I still still shoot a lot of film with Nikon bodies. And, um, you know, to put that glass on the DA 10, it's just not really up to the par, uh, for it. You know, I, I do have like kind of that, uh, 14 to 24, which matches it really well. And a couple of other lenses that match it really well. But as far as like the majority of my class is concerned, I wouldn't even put it on there. So yeah, that's, but... you know, something that people have to take into consideration because just buying a new body that has more megapixels, there's a lot of other things that are, that are going to go along with that. Yeah. I mean, if you want the most out of that sensor and what the camera can do, you're not adapting glass. And, and you know, unless you're cool with that particular look, then and I've done that many times. Um, but to go back to, you know, what is the, why are all these new systems on the market coming on the market? I believe that there's, that the like camera systems like micro four thirds kind of paved the way because they were the, they were the, o, they're the OG of the modern mirrorless camera. People would argue it's Leica from back in the day, but we're talking modern mirrorless autofocus, IBIS, eye detection, all that comes to micro four thirds first for the most part, minus the sensors because they got to buy them from Sony and Sony is like, we ain't giving anyone our best sensors. And hopefully that changes someday because it's kind of lame, but whatever. Uh, so they kind of paved the way that I think what happened is that the, con the consumers got a taste of like, man, I can see the photo, what it looks like before I shoot it. I can see these cool filter effects. I can see, you know, all these things um, makes Video easier. Well, not a lot of people shoot video, but for me, I'm like, oh, it makes shooting video easier. All these things that I get. And then, of course, you know, these camera companies, finally, Nikon and Canon started coming out a little more seriously. But that has given a really good opportunity for someone like Panasonic to develop a system from scratch and come out on the market. It's given Sony tons of... Of, of, of leeway. I think if Canon and Nikon got serious about mirrorless when Sony did, Sony would not be the Sony of today. If they, if they went full out, but Canon and Nikon, let's just be real, man. They still ain't going full out. It, not yet. They will be though. Very shortly. Maybe. I can guarantee you. I hope so. They, they're going to have to, or, or I mean, 
they're going to have to. They're going to have to because Sony's got rad bodies, lenses right now. Like, eh. Canon's got rad lenses. Bodies are kind of, eh. Uh, but Sony is just like, and I think Sony is being very strategic when they come out with their new cameras. It's like, did they need to really replace the A7R3? No. That camera's fine. It's Nothing's wrong with it. It's it's still new. But they're like, nope, here's another one. Bow. Personally, if I was a Sony shooter, I would think I'd be a little upset because I'm like, you know, they're basically devaluing their, their other cameras in the, in the marketplace. And it's like, cool, now... Well, let's be real, though. They've been doing that since they started with mirrorless, right. honestly. Right. I mean, so if you if you bought into that system at the get go, I think that you're you're used to it by now. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I, I, I would like to see a little bit longer life um, product cycles for the cameras. It used to be with film. Nikon would release a new F camera every decade. Years, years and yeah. years and years and years. Yeah. And that was because, of course, you buy different films and you buy different lenses and you get, you know, higher quality of image. So I like to see that with cameras, but more so, um, you know, more so than that, there are other things that camera companies can do and most that should do to make the, the camera better. Because the sensor is like the sensor is like the default thing. If you're really not, if you really don't know a lot about photography or cameras, you just talk about the sensor, and that's an easy thing for people to understand once they get into it. But when you start actually shooting, you're concerned with other things like workflow primarily, um, ergonomics, you know, connectivity, which is I guess part of workflow. The, the lenses, yep. you know, you don't want giant lens. I mean, who wants a small body and a massive lens? And that's been kind of the disconnect, I think, with the mirrorless stuff is you have uh, not necessarily in the micro four thirds camp, but, you know, as far as the full frame is concerned, you have these smaller bodies and these gigantic lenses. And it just to me is is ridiculous. Um, you know, it'd be like putting a 300 millimeter on like the GM1, which is like this tiny little body, and then sticking a you know Pringle can on the end of it. Yeah, that's essentially um, kind of what it is. I'm gonna if you're listening, I'm actually gonna show something kind of silly. I have a an Olympus 12 to 100, which is a badass lens. Such a nice lens, but I'm gonna put it on a GM1 just to show how yeah silly this is. I mean, but honestly, that's kind of what you know when you put say like the new Sigma Art series on like a Sony body. That's kind of how it looks, right? Minus the amazing zoom that this has and the dual IS and everything else. Um, sure, but yeah, that's that's essentially what's happening, and you know, it hurts it hurts your hand after a while. And I'm a big guy, man. I'm a big guy, you know. Um, you know, I eat my pudding cause I eat my meat, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, you know, grabbing those small bodies with no grip and then you go to grab it with this giant lens. It's kind of like, come on. I mean, they're bigger lenses than their DSLR counterparts. Yeah, completely. They have to be, they have to be though. Let's just be, you know, they have to be, if you want that kind of image quality to take advantage of that high-end sensor you have to have these bigger optics because people want now people are like well what about like a m well, right Leica m doesn't have autofocus it doesn't have mm-hmm. uh, ibis it doesn't mm-hmm. have all these other computer systems in the lenses it's just glass and metal that's it so you can make those smaller and yes you can adapt those to your modern full frame cameras or micro four thirds or whatever but you're losing all those fancy things that, you're, that you get. So sure, you buy a full-frame mirrorless camera, and you can get them small. You can get them smaller than some of the Micro Four Thirds cameras. But then, to take advantage of it, you got to go with a really large lens. And, which sucks. Which sucks. <laughs> and they're expensive. They're expensive. At, uh, on the, off, the, off the top of my head, the 24 to 70 2.8 uh, Sony G Master lens, which is a dope lens. I've had it twice. It's a dope lens. It's like two thousand bucks. Yeah, I was gonna say it's like twenty five hundred or something right. in that range. Whereas the Olympus twelve to eighty brand new is what like seven hundred bucks. I want to say. Uh, it hovers around. Yeah. A, I want to say it hovers around maybe a thousand. 
Yeah, I mean, you can find it on on. They have a special run in right now. I mean, you could probably get it brand new for seven fifty to eight hundred. You know, and there you go. And of course, let's let's. Or you can buy used for like five hundred bucks. Right, right. And then a Panasonic <laughs> twelve to thirty five two eight is the same thing. Let me just throw it out there though, because people are going to be like, and I hate this so much, but they're like, well, the full frame equivalent. Well, whatever. Look, f one point four on a smaller sensor lets in the same amount of light as a bigger sensor. It's just, it's still, that's, that's why they're standards. It's F 1.4. That the field may change, but whatever you could see that. I mean, and people still talk about that too, with the smaller cameras, you can't blur the background or now they're talking about equivalent. And again, it's just, it's just people that don't, I think don't shoot as much and they talk more about the tech, which is fine. But you know, I, this is, on this EM1 Mark II, I have an Olympus 12 millimeter two. It's super tiny. It's still a 12 mm-hmm. millimeter 2.0. I still get that amount of light in. Do I care if I got less depth of field? Not really. I never shot an assignment ever, ever, where they're like, you know, Julia, we need to have really shallow depth of field and make it look like um, like a senior portrait. Like I've never ever had that happen. Ever. And, and honestly, you're going to be picking the sweet spot of the lens, you know, and for the most part. So if that's at F2 on that lens, that's what you'll probably be shooting at. But, you know, it, it's not I, I, I don't get it, honestly. I mean, I have, I, have, I have a Nikon 51.4 and I think I've shot it at 1.4 twice. <laughs> you know, to me, it's just not it's not the way that I shoot. Right. Well, you and I are kind of old school in that regard, more traditional. I think a lot of people are as well, but there is a trend and this has been going on for a while because some of the bigger Instagrammers and it's brave of them. Like they, they take photos, you look at it. That's kind of cool because it's on a small screen. You can't see all the, the boogaboos, all the, the garbage that comes out with the, the post processing that they're doing. But now, now if you slide over, they're showing the BTS photo and these are very simplistic images, how they're capturing it. I'm seeing like, no reflector, no strobes, no nothing. And I'm not saying this to diss on them. I think it's really brave, and I think it's inspiring that they're showing these really cool images that were shot in such a, a poor way, I guess, if you were to compare it traditionally. Not, But, I mean, who can compare that in the world that we're in? And so what, what's happening is where you do get an advantage with larger sensors is if you're shooting in bad light, Mm-hmm. And you want to really post-process the heck out of it, like you were saying earlier, to make it look a little more acceptable. Now, if you have a smaller sensor, and anyone that shoots micro four-thirds well, or APS-C, or whatever knows, that you could do low light with any camera if you understand how to use light and exposure and lenses and all that. So when I, in my mind, I have a filter when people say, well, I can do better low light with full frame. I think, oh, better in, in poor light. With yeah. Full frame. And there's a difference there. That's, that's something to kind of point out is there's, there's a huge difference between low light and poor light. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people get that confused in my opinion. Yeah. I think, I think most, most do. In fact, I actually taught a class for Panasonic when I was sponsored by them. It was a classic I designed on my own called low light done right. And I would be sitting there with out of Chicago. That's it. Out of Chicago. Out of some other places too, if I recall. But you know, people are like, "Wow, oh, you're shooting low light with a mirrorless with a micro four thirds." Like, yeah, of course, because they have an f one two lens, yo. You got IBIS, and it's yeah. low light, but it's it's done right. Versus, you know, you, you know the, the stuff you see, and, and I'm not saying that that is wrong. What we see, it's just it's just a trend that that is happening. But people should know that if you if you just use the light correctly or or you know understand it a little more, and it takes practice. Low light with any camera is is acceptable. I've done low light with the GM1. You know. Me too. It's good. I have. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I love that little body. So. Um... Me being a DSLR shooter. What? <laughs> yeah, well, half and half. No, I, I okay. shoot I shoot a lot of different stuff. I shoot film, I shoot micro four thirds, I shoot tiny point and shoot cameras. Um, should I go to full frame mirrorless? 
if if you're getting what you need to get with your your Nikon's, I don't think you should. I, I mean, I don't think you should. The, the like the Nikon mirrorless cameras are cool. The Sony mirrorless, I mean, they're all cool. But he, I mean, what? God, a D800 goes used. D810. I mean, D810 goes actually. used pretty cheap. I want to say around eight hundred bucks. Eight hundred bucks. Eight hundred bucks. Why would you? Why would anyone sell that camera for eight hundred bucks to go buy basically the same camera? Oh, you won't get eight hundred for it. That's how much you can buy one for. <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, I couldn't imagine why anyone would want to sell one of those to get basically the same camera in full frame. Now, if someone's like, you know, I am just tired of carrying all this stuff around, and they want a lighter kit. Then they sell it and they get uh, gently used or a new mirrorless system. And I know like Olympus, I want to say even Panasonic does like these trade-in events. I know Fuji does. That would make sense if you if if it's like for the purpose of utility. Maybe you're traveling more, or you have a back injury or something, or you just you know you want to carry a camera everywhere. That makes sense. But to just go from like one full-frame DSLR to a full-frame mirrorless. I think it's more of a headache than it's than it's worth, don't you? I mean, do you think that the um, the real time aspect of seeing the image in the viewfinder is worth that bump? If you have a DSLR and you you know how to use it, you, that's in your head. So I I don't see the the direct benefit. Yeah. And just so people know, I'm I'm just kind of putting this out there. <laughs> no, they're good. They're good questions. I mean, I, I like the benefits I get from the EVF. I like using the highlight shadow um, mm-hmm. uh, warnings that, with the OMD. I like uh, the live histogram and the Panasonic, and they also have the zebras and stuff. I like those tools, but I would also be okay without it the majority of the mm-hmm. time. Because that's because well, and your you know, your Fuji doesn't. I mean, you can switch into just the old school uh, viewfinder, right? On the yeah. Fujis that you have. Yeah. And once you shoot, so, once you get your once the light is good, if the light's not changing rapidly, you don't think about it anymore. You just you're just operating. Mm-hmm. You know, creating at that point. So I don't know, man. If I would move over, because it's not only that you're going to lose so much money in the glass. Mm-hmm. so much money in the glass that is you know that's ridiculous um and then you then a lot of that glass is not available on say a nikon mirrorless so then what do you do you adapt and now you basically for the purpose of having maybe a slightly smaller body maybe slightly better video and an evf you have also significantly slower autofocus and larger glass now because you have the adapter on the end of it Exactly. I mean, yeah. And I will say like that 14 to 24 that I use is, is a gigantic lens. I'm uh, kind of demoing out a, an EM5 Mark II right now, and oh. I'm looking forward to getting the Olympus equivalent to that, which would be their, their 12 to, uh, what is it? It's a 7 to 14 on the Olympus stuff. And just because of the size of it, I think it'll be great. Yeah, and there's so. two, oh, there's two 7 to 14s. Isn't there like Panasonic's got one? And then mm-hmm. It's an F4. Well, they have that, uh, what is it, 8 to eight to 18? Which is, a, which is a Leica, but Panasonic has their own 7 to 14 F4. Oh, yeah, 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 the older one. The older right, one. right. And... and and then they have the eight to eighteen, two eight to four Leica collab, mm-hmm. and then which I've shot with. That's a fantastic lens. Yeah, totally. And then the Olympus has the seven to fourteen two eight, which is pretty rad. Um, yeah, I, I just, I really, I, I think people got to slow down and kind of like understand that that social media is 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 a marketing platform. It's designed to sell goods and services. I'm not saying it in a bad way. Just that's just what it is. Um, so when you see people that are, you know, working for various companies, they're not necessarily, at least in my experience, I was never told, "Hey, G, you got to move more of this product," because that was not my job. I was like, they were like, "Go use this, have fun." So naturally, you talk about it. But I don't know. Like I, I've always been a believer in micro four thirds. I, 
I'm hesitant on full frame because of the cost and the size of the lenses. Sure. And then the, and then the, 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 the real world utility of, of it. You know, I don't, I, I just, for me, I just don't see it. Um, you know, I'm not in, like I said, I'm not saying they're not good cameras they are great, but it's like, you know, when I bought my seven R three system, I bought the camera and two lenses. It was like eight thousand bucks. That's not cheap. No, at Dude, all. My I have a really nice truck, Forerunner. I spent ten thousand bucks in it. <laughs> and, and unless something major happens to that thing, I'll be driving that into retirement. And I'm like, I won't be taking a. And that's kind of one of the things that I thought about. I was like, dude, I'm like, this camera is almost the cost of my uh, my vehicle or whatever. And I'm like, eight thousand dollars can buy you just a wicked camera system from like a different, like a micro four thirds and like a new computer or whatever. And I was like, I, you know, and I'm like, am I am I with my trained eye? Am I really seeing the difference? And it just wasn't. You know, there was an article that you had talked about, um, or that you had, you had shared with me from uh, Sans Mirror, Tom Hogan. Can you? Uh, Tom Hogan site. Can you kind of briefly go over that? He, um, you know, he just kind of breaks down like where we're at with all the full frame stuff. Uh, you know, for me, kind of the ending part of the article is where it gets really interesting, and that's. You know, he basically says, as intriguing as all, all these super high resolution sensors are, he feels that the camera companies are basically not paying attention to the things that they should be, which are useful photographic features such as er- ergonomics, the menuing system, um, you know, things of that nature that really benefit the photography (laughs) of, you know, like you making an image, Um, you know, and he goes out to point out that like the difference between a a 60 megapixel sensor and a 45 megapixel sensor is really only a 20% resolution increase, which for most people, you're just not even going to see. So, um, you know, uh, it's, it, it really kind of drove it home for me. Like, that were kind of on this runaway train of upgrades. And, um, you know, kind of one of the other things that he says is why aren't they like looking at things like HDR and bracketing and, uh, you know, interval shooting and focus shift and, and pixel shift and, um, being able to combine all those in camera. I mean, you're talking about, something that is going to take a lot of CPU power. That's kind of where the, the new Olympus, the EM one Mark three or X, I should say, um, you know, that's kind of where that's coming into play is, you know, they really kind of amped up the power of that. And that's where he thinks that these camera companies should be kind of moving towards as opposed to just throwing a bigger sensor in, which is kind of what they're doing. You know, they're not really, it's more of a uh, evolutionary thing, not a revolutionary thing. Totally. And that's the one thing that one of the aspects of the micro four thirds that I really dig is how much computational photography they put into uh, their, their cameras because they've been, you know, we've had pixel shift in there for a while. IBIS, all the, all these things are, I mean, if you need high resolution, for tabletop work or landscape, you could do it. Um, That's actually why I bought the the EM5 Mark II because I wanted to see kind of the comparison between tabletop shots with that versus my my Nikon D810. Have you have you had a chance to try that yet? I haven't gotten into it yet because it just came in um, at the end of last week. Ah, so. okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know that that's the thing. So. And you know, he's also mentioning how like the the marketing is is brilliant. They're, they're rolling out uh, really clever marketing with DP review, and you know, and they'll say they'll swear up and down, but you know, it is a site that's owned by Amazon. Yeah, they want you to buy cameras. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what it is. Um, 
I want to see better workflow uh, features in cameras. Like you can kind of sort of do naming, but I want to have better naming. I want to be able to put my file names and however I want it into the camera. I want stuff like that. I want better connectivity to my mobile device. And, you know, like the G9's got we got Bluetooth, which is a step in the right direction. Uh, I know the EM1X has GPS built in, which is fantastic. I had that in the 5D Mark IVs that I had, and that was probably my favorite feature out of the, that camera was like built-in GPS. It's just nice to have that metadata squared away, so you don't have to go in later on and try to do it. Because a lot of us, and I, I'm I'm pointing at myself, are a little sloppy with the workflow. Oh yeah. I mean, I know for me, when I'm doing my landscape stuff and I'm on a trip, it, it's if I don't take a photo with my iPhone, so I have the GPS coordinates, I'm screwed. Because then it's like, where was this shot again? What, Where was I with this? You know, I mean, I'm in the backwoods of Canada somewhere, and I'm like, I have no idea what lake this is. Yeah, totally. I mean, like when I, I was on vacation in Seattle recently, and I'm like, after like the – first few hours you know trying to like keep up with roman and val and i'm like i don't have time to like try to synchronize all this I, I guess the the camera had bluetooth so it was connecting um but like the gm1 has an older way of connecting and it's just like you have to synchronize and i'm like nah just forget about it it's like too much <laughs> trouble you know but that's the kind of stuff where we, where we want to be able to connect um yeah, I mean, it should be low power Bluetooth stream. You know, if you want that, it should be zip in low res JPEGs of the raw files that you shot to your phone, so you have them immediately available for up for uploading. Yeah, stuff like that. Better better user interface. You know, the Panasonics are are actually quite good. The EM1 Mark II is actually better than I thought it would be because I've not played with a uh, uh, high end Olympus in a long time. And I was like, wow, this is much better than I thought it would be. But still, some things are not where, to me, they make sense. Like the, you can how you like organize what you're going to see on an EVF versus the LCD. They're like in totally different areas. And I confused the heck out of me. I'm like, where is this? Now, they do add things like you can add a My Menu. I think that is available in the Olympus as well. And that stuff yeah, helps. Is. That stuff helps. But I want to see that. I want to see like a revolution in that aspect. You know, one of the things that on the EM1 Mark II that I love is the ergonomics. Like, there's the, um, you know, these strap lugs that stick out of the sides of the cameras. Like, the the GM1 has it. Mm-hmm. These giant metal strap lugs <laughs> off of a camera that, that weighs, I don't know, like a quarter of a pound. Yeah. And these are the same lugs that are, like, on, on a D800, which makes yeah. sense because it's a bigger camera. It's heavier. You got space, but on a camera this small, all they do is stick into your hands. And I know why they put it on there because I asked the engineers, and it's for the appearance of higher quality, but at the sake of usability. And that, that's I always find that to be a bummer. I'm like, you know, if I want a camera that's not that usable but looks really good, then I'm gonna go look at a Leica. You know, when I have a camera like micro four thirds i want a a highly usable camera that i can do for a variety of stuff because i don't want to go have fun when i when i when i shoot so those are these are things where i think the cameras should be uh improved more jpeg settings you know like i don't know if i can do this with the olympus because i've not tried it but i know they have the olympus viewers not viewer the olympus is its workspace Mm -hmm. software which allows you to tether and stuff I wonder if you can tweak your JPEGs in that app and then upload those settings to your camera. I think that would be fantastic. Yeah. That that that's the kind of stuff I want to see because it's like I, I mean I'm all about shooting raw, but if you can get a JPEG how you want it in camera, then you have your raw as your well, especially with all the emulation stuff that olympus does you know they have just i mean pretty much anything is available on there as far as black and white and you know film simulations they're they're right up there with fuji as far as that's concerned yeah and and now like with i have a a lumix g9 here that i'm i'm playing with and they're pretty close as well 
uh, surprisingly, uh, they've done some, I don't know what they did behind the scenes, but at Panasonic, but they put some really good color tools and color rendering in, in the camera. And, you know, we want to see more stuff like that versus like, yeah, your camera was 20 megapixels. Now it's 24. And you're kind of like, oh. Yeah. I mean, it really, you really want like the next evolution of, of what these things are capable of. And, you know, as, as the processors and the cameras are getting more advanced, you know, you can just only hope that like, they're going to be, you know, like what Olympus is doing with kind of their pixel shift. And you're able to actually do that handheld now, uh, which you weren't on the previous, you know, like say with the camera that I just picked up, I have to use that on a tripod, but I know the EM one X, I know you can do that handheld now. So, um, you know, I mean, just being able to do stuff like that is just, yeah, honestly, it's kind of a game changer in a lot of ways. It really is. I mean, I think you can hold it down like a 60th of a second, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. They're, they're just the, the IBIS in those cameras is just absolutely crazy. But, I mean, that's because of the smaller sensor, you know? I mean, you can really kind of tweak that and make it to where you're, you're hand-holding down to a couple of seconds because of that sensor size, which you there's no way in hell you could do that with a full-frame And sensor. with those big lenses, too. I mean, just, just yeah. forget about it. You know, what's interesting, too, and if you go even smaller in sensor, you think about iPhone and the Pixel 3, they're doing some even crazier stuff with those small sensors. You get some pretty good results. Not the same as a dedicated camera, but in the world of smartphones, they're doing some really good stuff. And if I got to shoot some video on a pinch, I'm grabbing the iPhone, you know, yeah, you don't get the depth of field that you would with a larger sensor, but it's like, I mean, I'm not, I don't really care at that point. I'm getting a video of my son doing son cute to share with grandma versus getting a video with one of my micro four thirds cameras I'm playing with. Then I got to take it out. I got to put it in. I got it right here because I use it all the time. The dongle. <laughs> dongle gotta life. Put, yeah, Hashtag gotta, dongle life. Right. Then I got to put it in the phone. And then I got to send it out versus, you know, with a three-year-old, it's like shoot, it with the, shoot the video at the phone, send it off to grandma. She don't care. She's not going to be like, son, why doesn't your video have enough bokeh? Exactly. <laughs> she don't care. I don't want to see all this distracting stuff in the background. <laughs> but that, that's another area, though. I mean, the connectivity, but also the the, the video quality. Um, so Panasonic's got great video quality. The Sony's have really good video quality. Olympus video quality is good, but it's not the level of the Panasonic's. It's getting there, though. It's, it's surprisingly good with the EM1 Mark II. I just would like to see the time limit taken off and higher bit rate and my my fantasy camera hold on <laughs> fantasy camera is being able to shoot stills and videos you know without having to, to shift gears so imagine i mean these cameras now are shooting pretty high frame rates in raw so is this as this because the smaller sensors can um the manufacturers can work with better with the heat all the smaller sensors that control that. It would be dope that if you want to shoot video, now you're just shooting, you know, your raw raw video. And then, oh, when you need stills, you're, all you're really doing is altering. It's a mode where it just alters the, uh, the shutter speed, kind of like the 6K photo mode in the G9. Mm-hmm. But instead of JPEGs, raw, which is kind of like what the Olympus does with the Pro Capture. But it's, yep. it's, it's just uh, for a split second. Wasn't, um, I mean, I know I've seen some people pull stills from red. I mean, granted, that's like a completely different animal, but like from a red camera and they're basically, you know, still camera quality from the red raw. Yeah, that's exactly, they've been doing that for years. You know, and and I've done that on assignments with Panasonic's going into like a field, uh, not a field recorder, a, um, um, solid state recorder for video, mm-hmm. you know, cause like we're, a ninja and, yeah, and it, Atomos. It, exactly. That's exactly what it was an Atomos ninja. And then I used a Shogun, you know, and they're good in that regard, but it's, it doesn't have the same um, fidelity as the Roth files do. And that's really what's missing is that you still have a, a different 
feel to the raw files versus the, the frame grabs. You know, it's not far off, though. It's not far off. Like, for me, it would be like, do I want more megapixels or faster processors so I can shoot more creative stuff with photos? I'd be like, you know, the latter, for sure. So uh, are we going to see some Fujis on eBay soon? <sighs> Maybe. I like my Fujis. They're, they're cool. I bought them because I was shooting a certain type of work. And I was hoping to grow that into more of a business, but which is basically documenting, um, doing documentary work for, for organizations and, and nonprofits. But, and I knew this going in, the nonprofit world is tough and there's just not a lot of demand for that type of work. There's just not. So probably going to sell them. They do have surprisingly good video, the mm -hmm. X Pro 2s. Uh, no IBIS, but surprisingly good video. Autofocus for video is great. Like I've tested it, like almost like a like kind of like a vlog, and didn't have to worry about the focus. I just knew it was going to be in focus. But I haven't touched them in a couple months. Like seriously, I, I've been I'm there. just I'm just asking you if you're coming home. Oh, coming, yeah, coming I'm, home to yeah, Michael for Yeah, I mean, <laughs> coming home. It's like I, I, in a way, yeah. I've never left because I still ha I've always had some Micro Four Thirds since I left Panasonic including Olympus products. Um, but, you know, when I, le when I left Panasonic, and we'll have to do another show on this, but basically when I left Panasonic, I was I tried out, first I tried out, hold on, I'm trying to remember, because it was a lot. First I you tried out Canon, right? No, no. First I tried Sony. Okay. Then I tried Fuji. Then I tried Canon. Then I yeah, because you... You had the Mark IVs for a while. Then I tried Olympus. I had an EM5 too. It broke right away. Sadly, it's something with the EVF weird green splotches. Uh, then, hold on. Hold on. I got you. You sidetracked me. So, then you went to Sony again, right? Then I went to Sony again, right. And then I went to Fuji after that. Mm. So I, I, tried, I tried it all. I tried it all. Um, and you didn't try Nikon. <laughs> no, I mean, what sort of try? I shot, I shot Nikon film for no, years. No, I know. I'm just pulling your leg. Yeah, they're they're fine, but just what, I was like, yeah. I also kind of ran out of dough. Um, it ain't cheap to do that, but yeah, and it's like all the while I'm like, I just they're all good, but nothing resonated with me like with Micro Four Thirds. Um, I'm a little biased towards Olympus because I've always had fun with them. Mm. So. I don't know, but I'm playing with the G9, and the G9 is fabulous. I mean, it is it is impressive. Like, when I first started using it, because I'm doing reviews on these cameras, I'm like, wow, this is really, really that good. Yeah, I love the Panasonic menuing. I mean, to me, for, for whatever reason, that just is, like, the best as far as, like, all of, and I and I'm shot, you know, Fuji, Nikon, Canon, Olympus. I've shot a, a lot, a lot of different manufacturers um, through the years, and Panasonic, hands down, has the best interface, in my opinion. Oh, no doubt, and not that it's an awesome interface either. That's that's the no. It could be improved, but totally. But it's it's but even with that, it's still much better than 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 pretty much all the other menu systems. Which is crazy to say that, yeah. honestly. Yeah, I think if, <laughs> if anyone out listening wants to do, wants to experience the, the Spectrum, go to your camera store, play, ask to see a Sony, then ask to see a Panasonic. And you'll, you'll see what we mean. It's a huge difference. And I don't think that it's a big task to strain out these menu systems maybe it is i don't know i'm not a camera designer i just think they need to poach some people from cell phone manufacturers you know get a, get an android developer get an get somebody from the iphone team you know or somebody that is does apps for the iphone and have them rework your interface totally there's, there's so many ui designers out there that are just awesome yeah, and that, that, that's really what we need. Like, we need to be able to get into the menu. And I know people say, well, once you customize it, I got it. I got it. You can learn anything. Sure. I mean, but do you want to? Yeah, do you want to buy a 200-page book to understand how to use your camera? Yeah. No. 
you should be able to pick it up and be able to use it fluently in in about half an hour in my opinion yeah totally. and and without cracking a manual you know that's that's a good sign that you have a a product that they really thought about the ui yeah i give myself a weekend i'm like i go through the menus i play with it i shoot it if i don't understand the basics in a weekend i'm just like i don't, I don't know about this and that's kind of how i was with the sony is i was like man it's so it's in a way it's like I kind of felt like I was holding some type of futuristic product, but it, it was a feature that wasn't really all that appealing to me. Mm. You know. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's why I still go back to my film cameras all the time because it's just a different experience for me. It's it's like a completely different way of shooting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and the Fuji's menu systems are kind of wonky too, but you know, that's that's just part of the the deal now but these are areas it's their charm <laughs> these are areas where where the cameras should be improved is their ergonomics the connectivity the workflow the menu systems more so than like okay great so your camera can focus on the, the cat's eye super duper or whatever i mean you can just put the focusing box on the eye and get it in focus and who's looking at the eyes of these pets unless you're making them gigantic or, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting cynical in my old age. I, I don't know. I, I think the autofocus is very impressive on those cameras. I mean, for me as an action shooter, it would be, it would be awesome to use that. But I, nine times out of 10, when I'm out shooting, I'm kind of pre-focusing the scene anyway, you know? So it's, it's kind of would be, I don't know. I think it would be lost on me, but they're still neat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, it is amazing to see how that technology works, but there's other areas that I think need some, uh, completely some, some attention. So, I mean, for me, like my workflow is micro four thirds camera into my iPhone and I'm good to go. Then when I'm on my desktop, I download it. Well, actually it downloads automatically Lightroom CC and then I could just, export that quickly into my master catalog. Uh, I got a terabyte of space. It's pretty rad. I got a video coming on. It's a pretty wacky video talking about the 10 things in Lightroom CC that I think people should know. But these are the kind of things that get me excited about photography. It's like, it's not about like, what can the camera do? But it's what can I do with the camera? And am I enjoying that? Right? Am I enjoying that? Because I, you know, I mean, who wants to fumble with stuff? You want to like get out of your, get out of the screen and enjoy your life and stuff. Totally. So, well, dude, I think we 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 jammed on enough about this. Um, yeah, I got some pizza to go make. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> and I know, like, uh, I know um, Roman and Val are going to be due home soon. So, Chip, where should people go? They should follow you on Instagram and check out all your rad. BMX work, which is film and digital, by the way. Yes, film and digital, all across the board. Uh, Chip Riggs on Instagram, Chip Riggs for the website. I'm pretty much Chip Riggs everywhere. And of course, for me, Julio Shorio. I am on Instagram again after deleting my account. And Man, I'll have to follow you. I don't even think I'm following you I, now. I, I got no photos on there. I am, I am lurking and I'm studying. That's all. I'm, I'm seriously. Seriously studying what the uh, what the, the bigger accounts, the smarter accounts are doing, and I'm seriously studying YouTube. So you can follow me, and you can see the results when it happens. Um, but it should be pretty cool. So, awesome. Yeah, you know, I, I have a saying that's in my head, and um, this is the whole reason why we do this podcast and small camera, big picture, and everything. If you got a problem, yo, I'll solve it. (laughs) Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Small Camera Big Picture. Don't forget, if you do have Micro Four Thirds, I made the best raw profiles and presets called Dynapack Mark I. If you are a user of Dynapack Mark I, reach out to me. I want to know how you are using them because I'm starting to work on the next update, which you will have for free sometime soon. So thanks everyone. We will uh, talk to you in the next episode. Later.